one eight through seven on deck stand by Q actors. Electrics kill the blue run lights, please. Like you two and sound one A. Go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Hang In Focus. Um, this past Tuesday, we have a special red alert um, because we want to draw your attention on September 1st. That event was hashtag red alert, hashtag restart, and we make events. It was a coalition of trade bodies, businesses, unions, and live events workers who all together lit up their venues, homes, and even their cities in red. Over 1,500 locations across North America participated. This includes your very own Arizona Theater Company and our Temple of Music and Art. The event's effort was to raise public and media awareness in support of the live events sector. Live events in our country contribute over one trillion annually to the U.S. economy. And right here at Arizona Theater Company, we're an $8 million organization, which means we have a $20 million economic impact on Tucson, Phoenix, and the rest of Arizona. As you can imagine, 95% of all live events in our country have been canceled due to COVID-19. 96% of companies, including us, has cut staff and our wages. 77% of people in the live events industry have lost 100% of their income. And if you think about that, that's 100% of their income for up to five months now. Uh, and that includes 97% of all 1099 workers. So when you, you know, the actors that you love to come see or the designers that we bring in or so many people that we feel like that are part of our extended artistic family. These people have been out of work for five months with, um, and currently at this point, no exact time as to when they'll be able to receive some type of financial help from the government in the same way that other sectors that don't contribute as much annually like airlines uh, have been able to do. So we want you to check out the hashtag Red Alerts Restart and the website WeMakeEvents.org for the latest of these efforts. Um, we want you to reach out to the people in your community, your representatives to extend the pandemic unemployment assistance and support the local artists and staff that keep our state's creative economy strong. Yeah, you know, I think the the big thing to say to people is, is you know, people know that every organization is, is hurting right now. And they say, like, I don't have the money to be able to support those things. And that's, that's actually not what we're asking people to do. We're asking you to be in touch with your congressmen, to be, you know, with your governors, to your elected officials, and say that it is important for the arts to receive the same type of bailout funding that other industries have gotten, even though those industries contribute less to the overall economy than we do. So whether you think it's for the soul of your state, whether you feel like it's important for arts educations or whether you just think it's about the money, if it's just about the money, we contribute more. And if you can imagine that a trillion dollar industry could be gone after this is over, I, that's, uh, that's gonna have an economic impact of the entire country, regardless, any one sector going down. So we need people, if you can't make a donation, you can pick up the phone, you can send an email, you can find out who your elected officials are and let them know that you value culture, that you value these institutions, that you feel like we're not gonna be the same state that we were before if we come back from this and there are no theaters, no museums, no science centers, nothing for everyone to do except take in entertainment made in California, New York. And that's not what anybody wants. Absolutely. And so, and thank you for that, Sean, um, because it's really vital um, being someone that has been both in administration now and being an actor uh, relying on those contracts really does help you pay your bills. I mean, it's survival. Um, so many arts performers may end up homeless over this. And that is the reality if we do not extend those um, benefits back into their hands. Yeah, so if you wanna just talk about like actual numbers, right? So the maximum unemployment you can receive in Arizona is $250, mm -hmm. right? So that regardless of what your salary was when you were making before, right? And so when, when the government was putting in the extra 600, that made a huge difference in terms of people's ability to be able to get through this, to plan for ahead. Um, you know, we have, Let's be honest, we have employees who were supplying their entire family and paying for it, and it just had children. 
before that this happened. And so to then now turn to them and say $250 a week is what you can provide for us. I mean, that's, that's not enough. And so I think we have to think about, you know, the US government has been there when other industries have needed them to repeatedly, right. you know, right. and it's time for the arts to start making that same type of rallying cry to say like our people are just as valuable our money is the same as theirs and also that's the thing that we know during this pandemic everyone is turning to right how you, you know look up all the people that write for your favorite netflix show i promise you they're playwrights look at the actors that are in your favorite shows i promise you that they did regional theater before they got there so this is really like a gut check moment for our country of what type of country do we want to look like after this is over Right, and the arts are essential. We need them. Um, there's a lot of uh, depression that is going on surrounding the pandemic and how people are handling things. And art and entertainment has been what has been able to pull people you know, out of those funks. And without it, uh, we won't survive. You know, So I'm so grateful to the influx of art that you see all across our social media platforms. Um, everyone is getting uh, really innovative on how they are presenting, you know, different television shows. Like everyone's using Zoom, which I love. Even, you know, uh, I think the Masked Singer had a <laughs> segment where they had a Zoom presentation of the stars that were talking from their homes. Or our, our Tonight Show, right, is also being done from within our homes. And so we're making the best of what we've got, but, you know, obviously we still need it and it's still vital, so. Yeah. So I just think I would say if you're watching this, if you have, and you know what, like, it doesn't even have to be us, whatever arts organization you love, whatever museum that you love, whatever children's, you know, museum or science center that you love, um, we're being told to expect that 40% of not for profits will not make it through this. Right. So if you can imagine, list all of your favorite ones that you love and take 40% of them out. That's about what it's going to be, unless people really step up and figure out ways to either draw attention to the fact, support themselves, get their businesses to support. And, you know, the thing I, I try to recommend to everybody is you can buy a subscription or a membership to any of the places that you love right now. That's and right. Um, yeah, you know, you don't even have to donate anything. And what happens is these organizations get money in the door right now. And then when we come back, in 2021, you get to go to the theater six times. You get to take your child to the museum 12 times. You get whatever it is that comes with being a member, but it's a way to be able to support just to make sure those organizations are there once we come back. Absolutely. All right, have we done enough of the like, <laughs> like we're real people, we're real, we're real. We're real people, to we're it. affected for real by this very thing. Our friends are affected. So, you know, right to representatives. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, all right, today is a, a pretty special one. We have only one guest for the entire time to, to talk with her about her upcoming reading that we're doing, but it's definitely someone that I could listen to forever and ever. So let's go ahead and bring on to the show Wendy McLeod, who is world-renowned playwright, screenwriter, uh, and you know, uh, an inspiration to so many writers and an educator to so many writers. So let's go ahead and bring Wendy out to the show. Hello. Hello, Sean Daniels. Hello, Arizona. Hello. Hello. Now we have an interesting package that we'd love to play of, of Miss Wendy. Oh, oh really? Wow. Okay. All right. So what do we do? We all turn our cameras off mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll watch a little video. So hello, Wendy. And we'll be back in a second. So turn okay. your camera. Hello, I'm Wendy Cloud. <laughs> you are a comedy writer. You know what I mean? You Have you always been a comedy writer? Well, here's the thing. I think that what happened to me in my middle age is that I decided to stop fighting the fact that I was a comedy writer. Like, I felt like in my earlier years, I was trying to prove that I was a writer, you know, and comedy isn't taken particularly seriously. And so I think I was sort of bumping up against and once I just gave in to the fact that I write comedies, I felt there was this great kind of blossoming and, and that I knew how to do something that a lot of other people didn't know how to do. And it isn't always fashionable and it isn't always taken seriously by the critics, but audiences love it. And ultimately, they're the ones that matter. Can you just say a little bit about like your inspiration for writing it and, uh, you know, some of the thinking that went into it? 
Well, it was inspired by a real evening I spent with my family when we went on vacation in Palm Springs. And everybody was tired and hungry, and it was Sunday night, and we found one restaurant open, still open, and we sat down to order our meal, and we encountered the most extraordinary waiter that I've ever met. And by that, I mean bad. The worst waiter I have ever, ever had. And he seemed to kind of thrill to his power to control whether or not we got our food and drinks and when we got them and who got them first. And it was just a sort of a fascinating character study. So that was the, the launching point for the play. And, um, you know, the other thing that I had been thinking a lot about is it's very rare to see a play about a good marriage, an ordinary marriage, because you usually see plays about relationships in crisis. So this crisis is very mild. It's a, it's a hungry couple celebrating their anniversary. But, you know, I, I often some say that, I, that it's just a comedy. And I really want to interrogate that and say, it's not just a comedy because we all hunger to laugh. And there's something so extraordinary about being in a room full of people, an audience who is, is sort of laughing at the antics of these three characters, right? But I do think that a good comedy can last and that's what I hope for. Yeah. That it'll, it'll continue to be funny outside of this time and place. Wow. Uh, first of all, you know, we did that interview like a little bit ago. So you can also tell like in the background of my house, like we've decorated since the pandemic happened, right? So at the very beginning, we we're like, nothing's on the walls. And now we're like, finally, we've moved in. Um, so uh, Wendy, uh, so amazing to to see all the the posters of Slow Food, so many of them. How many productions have there been? I have no idea. In fact, it was like I was looking at these posters that I'd never seen going, oh, I wonder where that was. It was it was cool. I noticed Boise was one. I'm going to have to check it out. Um, that So uh, one of the things I love about this and Women in Jeopardy, right, is that they're both the inspirations were based off of real events, right? Like actual events that happened to you. And then you took that and made it into a, a madcap comedy. Right. And what I always tell my students is that you take something real and then you turn up the gas, right? So you make the stakes a little higher, the circumstances a little bit more extreme, and, and then it, you're kind of off and running. How, you know, I guess when I was watching all of those productions, you know, you I feel like you are um, such an expert uh, at comedy, right? And I know I've, I've even, like we've sat, I've sat with you in previews and you will talk about the difference between like a smile to a little laugh, to an actual laugh, to like a guffaw, right? And then like, what is the calculation along the way of like, what do you have to do to move people along there? What's it like to give up then, you know, your script and have all these people do it and then you hope that they understand the comedy of what you're doing? Right. Well, you kind of have to trust your own instincts. And, and a lot of times if I'm laughing while I'm writing, that's a good sign. And, <laughs> it, you know, I think I've told you before that, that my favorite thing is to actually see somebody slap their knee because you hear about <laughs> knee slapping comedy. And when you see an audience member go like that, you go, oh my God, it's a knee slapping comedy. Um, the other thing with slow food that, that you must have noticed as well is that couples come to see it together and then there's a lot of nudging. You know, the yeah. wife is nudging the husband, the husband is nudging the wife, you know, hey, that is so much like you, that is just like me. You know, there, there's um, a beautiful sort of recognition that people feel. Um, have any, have, uh, have there been any fights that broke out at Slow Food, <laughs> you know? Not that I'm aware of, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, well, I just think, you know, one of the, I mean, I think you are one of the great comedy writers in our country to be doing this. And I'm, I'm so glad, I'm always so glad to hear your story about deciding to stop being a quote unquote writer and, you know, going into comedy, because I think a people aren't encouraged to go into comedy. And then even on top of that, women are 100% not encouraged to go into comedy, right? That it's just not uh, the type of you know, that it feels like it should be more thoughtful or more quote unquote feelings if it's written by that. And so for you to just come in and be, I think, 
this, you know, you're so mathematical about it. You're so smart. You're so unrelenting. And it's, you're so unpo unapologetic in terms of writing a comedy that I feel like that's what I love about your writing so much. Well, I love you telling me what you love about my writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's wonderful, especially right now um, with everything that's going on in the world. Like we just had a, a, a thing pop up from Facebook that said that uh, Laura Evans was like, I'm looking for a comedy. I'm excited about a comedy right now. And I think that is honestly what we need. Um, how do you feel like, especially with what's going on right now about your work being used to uplift? Well, that's, that's really interesting question about doing a comedy at this particular time where we're going through, you know, at least three crises. And I think the interesting thing about it is that it's less dated than some of my other plays. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it, it remains consistent because there are still marriages, there's still waiters, there's still restaurants. I mean, not that we can go to them, but, but there is some sort of common thread that endures through our various crises. But maybe that nostalgia too. That's right. That's right. Restaurant. We're like, oh my God, I would take a terrible waiter right now over anything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Even if just the bread <laughs> came and he never came. Home. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We didn't know how good we had it back then. When we had, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So I just, I do, I always want to know a little bit of the journey though. You say that you, you know, you were a writer and then you gave up being a serious writer and then you, you know, you had started writing comedies. Can you just fill us in a little bit more about how does someone become, you know, a Wendy McLeod? Like how, what is the actual journey of going through it? Like what were some of the productions and what are some of the key moments that really you decided to eventually say, screw it, I'm a comedy writer and that's what the that's what the universe wants me to be. Well, it was very interesting. When I was in graduate school at Yale, what was really in was sort of BAM and Robert Wilson and sort of, you know, um, performance art and downtown art. And, and so I always felt a little bit like unhip just because I was interested in narrative, I was interested in story, I was interested in beginning, middle and end. And I think one of the things I discovered like with the House of Yes is that in a way, the more serious, the more serious I wrote, the funnier it was. So it, it was something about like writing into the truth of a situation and um, finding out it was funny. And I think the other thing, like the big jump for me with House of Yes is I felt like what a lot of people were doing was feeling like they had to write about you know, working class characters or people on the streets or sort of like, and, and I felt like if, if I wrote about the people I knew who are smart and funny, like, wouldn't that be interesting to watch? And so I think one of the reasons why the House of Yes landed, it was about people who felt a lot, but used their intellect and used their wit to cover it all up. Which isn't like anybody that we know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, so, so keep us going through it. So you're, you're, you're writing, you know, you decide to write this different type of thing. Is it immediately successful? Is it immediately, you know, are people picking up on it? Are you? Well, House of Yes was successful. And then what's funny is I wrote actually quite a serious play about abortion called The Water Children. Um, which was sort of exploring whether there's a third point of view that isn't, you know, pro-choice, pro-life, but that there's something else. And then to take a, like a break after writing that, I wrote a play called Schoolgirl Figure, which is basically a comedy about anorexia. And it's a buddy movie between a bulimic and an anorexic. And it takes place in a high school where there are sort of gangs of girls that are called the Carpenters. And, um, and there's a tribunal of sort of dead anorexics that remind everybody, you know, to drink their waters and not to eat sugar and everything. So it was very surreal. It was very dark. It was very funny. But I, I wrote that play as sort of, um, I was taking a break in a way. And, and so there's kind of a push pull, I think, that when I go to one extreme, the next play, I sometimes go back to the other extreme. Although I will say that with Women in Jeopardy and Slow Food, it was sort of two comedies in a row which was fun. And I think that's when I, you know, that's largely because I started working with you at that point. Yeah. Um, and have, have things since you've kind of started leaning into comedies more, do you feel like things have changed in terms of your national reputation or the people that you work with or how, how is, how is really leaning into comedies affected right. you? 
Well, I, I mean, I'm getting a whole lot of productions. I mean, they're getting <laughs> done everywhere. And, you know, maybe the, the simple truth is, you know, they're not being done off Broadway yet, but they're getting done regionally with like real people and real audiences. <laughs> I mean, that's who wants to see them, you know? And, and you know, I hope at some point some wonderful actors, because, you know, some wonderful stars who will like light up a, you know, Broadway or off-Broadway marquee will do it and it'll get done in New York. But um, they're very popular. The comedies are very popular. So can you talk just a little bit about the your theories behind comedy and theater? Like, I know that you have some some great ideas. You're also very like the math of it. You're very much in touch with, you know, about what it is or delivery or amount of words or, you know, I mean, you're very much like a, a scientist trying to figure out the exact alchemy that gets us to the laugh to be able to do it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm so glad you asked. I have many, many theories, which I will now expound upon. But I've decided that if I were going to, to give myself a pretentious theater name, it would be the theater of inversion, right? So the whole way the comedy works is whatever you expect, whatever an audience expects, you wanna surprise them somehow. And there's a, a quote that was written about Pinter that I really love. Um, and now wrote, Roger Copeland wrote it in an article for American Theater. And, and what he said about Pinter was, if you're gonna pull the rug out from somebody, you better start with a real rug. So that's what I try to do is sort of establish a real world, real people, have people kind of invest in this world and these people, and then stuff happens and it goes sort of farther than you think it's gonna go. Um, one of my favorite essays is Freud's and it's called The Joke and the Unconscious. And it, it posits that comedy is about bringing the repressed into light. So if you sort of shock people and sort of go, oh my God, I can't believe she just said that. There's a laughter that comes out of that surprise and kind of delight that somebody has just tipped over a sacred cow, you know? Um, so that, that's what I think about a lot, that, that sometimes in comedy, you can say the things that you can't say otherwise. I, I think so. Oh, sorry. No, no, go for it. No, I, I think so. I find that in my household, we're a comedy household, right? My boyfriend would hate it if I told the whole Facebook audience right now that he has these little cards where he wants to be a stand-up comedian. It's so cute. <laughs> so we're big. We're big on comedy. And I find that what resonates with me are things that are real real life situations that I either can identify with or I can connect to, oh, my family member went through that thing. And if I belly laugh, it's typically something around that. It's not something kind of surface or super silly. It's the real things that we're going through. They're like, oh my God, yeah, that happened to me too. And that's what's funny. And I feel like your work captures, captures that. Well, and I think it's that feeling of, oh my God, I'm not alone. Other people have thought that, other people have done that, right? Which is, which is about, is kind of what theater is about in a larger sense, is that sense of community that's created when you're in an audience with other people. And I think it's always interesting to clock that you laugh differently when you're with 400 other people than you do at home, right? That there's something about the way that the person, I mean, like you would watch something on stage and people go, you know, they make noise or they do that, that if you were watching on your phone at home, you, you know, you do, you make no sound whatsoever, you know? You can right. watch seasons of The Office and make no sound whatsoever, even even though you loved it, you know, as opposed to like somehow there's something about the experience of being with other people that like something happens and an audience roars or if it's about, you know, class or race or something like half the audience roars and then the other half wants to know like why they were laughing. I mean, I think that's what's always that's also funny, right, because you have to your comedy is so much on your shared experience of what you understand. And not everybody shares the same experience when they sit down in the audience. Well, it, when I was a young writer at the O'Neill, I worked with a former television writer, like, you know, a television writer who worked in the 1950s named Max Wilk. And the funny thing about him is whenever he would attend a comedy, he wouldn't laugh. He'd go, now that's funny. So he never got out of his sort of mathematical head, right? He'd go like, now that's funny. And then, then you know you'd really scored. So that's not what real people do, right? Real people <laughs> give, give over, right? They're not on the outside watching, but, but I still think of Max. And I always think to do comedy is the bravest thing you can do in mm -hmm. the theater, right? Because it's the one thing that everyone in the audience is correct about. Like if an audience member goes, that, that wasn't funny, like it wasn't. 
yeah, you know, you, you don't explain to someone later that um, that is something was funny and then they enjoy it. And there's also this weird thing that happens in the first 10 minutes of a play where if you feel like it's not funny, you don't think something's not funny for an hour and then eventually thinks it's funny again. You think it's not funny and then you get angry when it's going <laughs> on, you know? Whereas if in the first 10 minutes you think it's funny, you kind of go for the ride. So it's really, in some ways it, it I find so, so much what we call, what I call theater funny is actually not funny. It's, it's like whimsical or smile, you smile watching it because I think playwrights are so scared of making an actual joke because if it fails, the stakes are so high. So instead you have like quirky characters who, right. you know, are enjoyable and you smile when you watch, but you don't risk anything because you know a joke that falls flat, you know, can kill an audience. And so I think playwrights, when they do comedies, play it safe. And therefore, when you think about comedies at the theater, everybody's like, oh, well, there's noises off. And then there's, well, we love noises off. You know, <laughs> I mean, like, so there, whereas in movies, right, there's, we have decades and oh. decades worth of like uh, amazing comedies. And I feel like theater writers have really wimped out on terms of, of taking that risk. Well, but on the other hand, the great thing for me about writing a comedy is you know if it's working, right? If they're laughing, it's working. Whereas when I write another kind of play, I'm like, are, are they with it? How can you tell, you know? Um, and, and I've also learned that you have to be patient because, because an audience warms up and you're actually sort of lighting a fuse for the, the TNT that won't explode until the second act, right? So you're, you're building things in that are gonna pay off. So you're getting chuckles, you're getting giggles, you know? And a lot of times the, the belly laughs come later. And that's where the insecurity comes for me, you know, is, is that I have to say, okay, we're, we're getting there, but we have to go at, at, our, you know, at its own pace. I know I work on comedy so much and then I work on a serious play and I'm like, how do you, how do you know if it's working? <laughs> I know, like nobody's made any noise for 45 minutes and everyone's like, shut up, they're enjoying it, like, yeah. you know. And you know, I think something, you know, so we're, we're spending a lot of time educating our audience on new plays, right? In terms of like, what does it mean to be a theater where new things happen? And I don't think people realize when you do a comedy, those preview audiences are, they teach you everything. I mean, we, I've, we've all had jokes that we laughed about forever and ever, every rehearsal. You know, we get to it and we just, we cry. And then if it doesn't get a laugh, the first three previews, right. it's out of the show. That's right. It, you know, and so I, I think what's uh, amazing for our audiences at Arizona Theater Company is they don't realize when we do comedies, their fingerprints end up being all over it, right? Because to your point, how does it work? Do they respond? Do they sort of get the joke? Are they confused? Like in many ways, they're, they think they've just come for a great evening. They're ultimately the focus group and I remember that when we did the world premiere of Women in Jeopardy, you, and we did it at Jiva Theater, you and I would sit on the far, like, up right side so that we could see the actors, but we could also see the entire house. Right. So that not only would we see, like, how the actors were doing, but, like, when did people shuffle? When did they look at their program? Yeah. When did nobody move? Right? When did they, were they kind of enjoying it, but looking at their watch? And you don't realize, like, in a comedy, you study the audience just as much to be able to go back and say, I don't know what's happening, but everybody's a little bored right here, right? Well, How can we fix it? One of my mentors at Yale was Lloyd Richards, who of course directed A Raisin in the Sun and went on to direct August Wilson plays. And he would require me to sit in the audience. He would never let me stand at the back or sit on an aisle. He said that you had to be surrounded by the energy to feel how it was going. Now, you know, I fudge that a little bit because I, I like the angle too. I like to see the silhouette of people responding, but it is important that you be part of the audience to sort of really pick up on what their experience is. Well, that speaks to your versatility as an artist too. Like I was just like imagining what it would be like to have worked so many hours on something by yourself, laughing by yourself, right? Before you present that into a room or a workshop, what is that process like to have people hear your stuff for the first time and laugh when you're like, oh, I was expecting a laugh, or maybe they laughed at something that you weren't expecting. And then does that change your opinion about it? Right. Oh, that's the best. You go, oh, that's funny. Oh, that's funny too. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten to the point, you know, I've spent so many years doing this that, that I feel 
pretty sure about what's funny. Like I know what's funny, you know? And for me, it's always an issue of the forest and not the trees, right? Tree to tree, I know I'm funny. And so what I need someone like Sean's help with is sort of making sure that the whole forest is visible and has the shape we want and all of that kind of thing. Um, but that's always a, a sort of delightful surprise when somebody laughs, you know, when a whole audience laughs at something that you thought was a sort of throwaway. I know that's the best part when you're like, oh my God, we weren't even working on that as a joke. And somehow, <laughs> somehow like everybody laughed or, or this is the other thing that happens sometimes, not the punchline, but the line before the punchline gets a big laugh. And then you're like, I guess we have to cut the punchline because now it's weird to get, you're like, let's watch tomorrow, right? And that's the preview audience thing. So you watch the second night to be like, does that happen again? And if it happens again, you're like, listen, the joke is over. You know, yeah. once the rhythm is broken and everybody laughs and then it feels sad to come back with a punchline. All right, I guess the audience decided where the punchline was. Well, it's like Jason Alexander in Seinfeld when he would get a laugh and go, I am out of here, right? So he'd always try to leave on his laugh. And yeah. that's right, you, you don't want something to be less than. So um, that's exactly the way the audience sort of collaborates until you tells you this is the big laugh, you know, cut the rest of the line or whatever. So uh, once we all come back, one of the shows that we're doing is Women in Jeopardy, which, uh, which we were going to do before, but I think now is gonna be you know, even more special to have that type of rip roaring comedy, right? When we're back. It's also based on a true story like Slow Food is. Can you just give us the backstory of how, of what the scandalous real story is that led to the creation of Women in Jeopardy? I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> we had a friend, a middle-aged woman who was divorced, who started dating again. And um, the the play was inspired by the first time we met the boyfriend who was a dentist in a nearby city. And um, he was awful and strange and bizarre. And just, and she, this, our friend was so like warm and lovely and forgiving. <laughs> and, and so um, the play, the first scene of the play is actually what the real conversation in the kitchen was between me and my friends talking about this man. And can you believe this? Who oh, is this guy? What did he say? And this, right? It was all that. <laughs> ah, and then you go out back into the dinner party and then you're in the kitchen. <laughs> you know? And so it was that kind of energy um, that, that led into to women in jeopardy. And I'm happy to say she's no longer with the dentist. Right. But there was a real murder, right? Well, this was the other real thing. And sometimes you kind of end up with a mashup of, of things that happen about the same time. In this little college town where I live in Ohio, there was a real murder. And um, the, it, it, I mean, it was gruesome, but it turned out to be a tree guy. So he was somebody who chopped down trees. And so I kind of played with the idea of what if this horrible dentist was in fact the murderer that everybody was looking for. So that the women were right that not only was he creepy, he was dangerous. And then that sort of upped the stakes for them having to save their friend from this man. Well, and you know, one of the things I've, I've heard you talk about, maybe you can say a little more about is that you also wanted to write a comedy with lots of fantastic women, right? Over the age of 40 in it and you know, every rehearsal that we did, everybody was like, all these women were so excited to be in the room with each other because they never get to be in shows with each other, right? right? They get to be in shows where they play the funny woman right. in it, or they see each other at auditions, Yeah, you know, you know, because they all know that they're all up for the same part and you hope that one of them's gonna get it, but that, you know, they never get to be in a show together. So can you just say a little bit about your impulse there to do that? Well, you know, I once saw Wendy Wasserstein speak on a panel and she said in her last year at Yale Drama School, she wrote Uncommon and Women and Others because she wanted to see an all woman curtain call. And that's what she got. And then when I was in college, I acted in that play. And, you know, that was a play that became important to me. And so I, I felt like um, I want what I get frustrated by when I see middle-aged women portrayed is they're always in relation to somebody. They're the wife, the girlfriend, the mother. And, you know, my playwriting students will often write, well, she's a mother. 
you know, that that's who, she's the mother, she's the mom. And you're like, okay, there's a, as many different kinds of moms as there are anybody else, you know? And so I wanted to write more than one middle-aged woman and I wanted them to be different from the, each other. And I wanted to explore the idea of female friendship. That is so empowering. I'm My other half of my life is I'm an actress. And a lot of my friends, um, and I, I mean, I look it, but I'm, I'm almost 40 as well. And no, a lot of my no, friends- No, no. <laughs> you don't look it, baby. Yeah, I know. You won't no. give me my two years, but I'm close. Yeah. Um, and it's so surprising to me how many of my friends that are women of a certain age, right, that have that love to perform, that are equity card holding members and never get an opportunity to express their craft because the canon doesn't have enough work that supports that. And I am so grateful to you for creating an opportunity, a vehicle for lots of different women to be able to still do the thing that they love. We need more playwrights that are focused on that demographic to provide more work. Well, and at Yale Drama School, you know, when they accept a class of acting students, they accept 12 men and five women because that's the casting distribution and they wanna make sure that everybody works during their three years in graduate school. And, you know, just the way I feel like I've um, honed my craft and my comic chops over time, that's what actors do, right? And so you have this kind of wealth of experience that isn't being tapped in, in many different ways. It's also true of actors of color, right? That they, that, you know, when I wrote a play that had three roles for actors of color, the talent that walked into the room was breathtaking. And, um, you know, you just want to use everybody, but yeah. You know, I, I think one of the things about Women in Jeopardy also is that all of the teenagers in it are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like it's so rare to have a comedy where like the young people aren't, right. they're, they're, not, they're not beautiful and overly sophisticated beyond their years, right? Which is always like, unless it's like Freaks and Geeks, you know, every TV show we grew up with was like 35 year olds playing teenagers. And you see that on stage, right? Also, and it's like, it's so refreshing in Women in Jeopardy to be like, no, they're just, you know, the, the women in the show are plagued by their, their children who they love, but are idiots. <laughs> which I feel like is such like a, an actual thing that you would express in the real world, but you never see on stage. That's a theater of inversion thing too, right? So that usually it's young people rolling their eyes at how clueless middle-aged people are. And, and right. either it's the other way around where they, they sort of have no idea. Yeah. That's right. It's, also, it's, it's a little bit the revenge of the smart woman against the pretty woman. Cause there's, there's the young pretty woman and women in jeopardy. And so, you know, of course she has to be dumb. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm so excited to do it because it's been a while, you know, it, that's also such a physical comedy um, that we do. And um, Jen Cody, who did the uh, world premiere of it, you know, and is coming back to do this again, she would send me weekly pictures of her bruises because <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's one of those shows where like you, you, you don't realize like that comedy artists are athletes. Do you know what I mean? Because they're specifically tossing them, in her case, you know, tossing herself like onto something, off of something, running into a drawer exactly the same way, you know, eight times a week. And, you know, and she's fearless, right? In terms of just like three feet tall, but she's fearless in terms of doing it. And she would toss herself all over the place. And, you know, the audience loved her for it, but you're like, oh no, she's like an athlete. She's uh, you walk off stage and you tape up and you ice up and you take your ibuprofen and you, you know, you rest up to be able to do it tomorrow. Well, back in the day, I acted in a production of Hay Fever, and it was actually with Alice and Janney because we went to college together. And I played Sorrel Bliss, and underneath my little flapper dress, I had knee pads because there was a sort of gag of when the unexpected guest arrives, I had to like fall to my knees. And doing this every night, I got this incredible bruises. So I finally got these sort of football quality knee pads and that really helped but it's true there's something about the body that's funny right and and that and there's often a dimension to comedy that is physical i think it's abandoned oh sorry no 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 like like to be to have that complete abandon i feel like comedy requires that as well and so to be physical allows that like yes and like i'm totally gonna go for it with the text and lend my body to the text to do 
whatever you ask of me. So when you write, are you literally envisioning, I mean, I know like someone like Sean could help you cultivate what that scene looks like, but when you're writing, do you think, and now I want someone to flip over a table or like, what are some of the ideas that you're like, this might be cool. This will create this, spark this kind of direction. Well, the way I think of it is leaving room. That is, um, you know, I try to remember that the comedy is not all in the dialogue. Yeah, the, 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 the comedy is in the situation. And, and, you know, Pinter is one of my favorite playwrights and the climax of his acts tend to be physical moments as opposed to spoken action, you know? And, and so I just try to pare away and leave room for the actors. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think it's like, so, you know, like, there are there are verbal comedies, right? There is like the importance of being earnest, I think is one of the funniest plays ever. People just walk on stage and talk. Right. And then walk off, right? And then there are like, how's, you know, the mix of leaving enough room for that physical comedy to happen, to be expressed to, you know, to let an actor, I mean, I think like, that's the great thing about your writing is like, it's so often like an invitation, I feel like each line. And so the actor can do something with it. You know, they can put a character on top of it or they could just deliver it, you know? And I feel like it still, it still ends up working, but yeah, it must be fascinating to figure out how much to leave to them. Um, well, that was the scary part of writing Women in Jeopardy actually, is when the play leaves the sort of the kitchen and the living room and the sort of grounded reality and they end up hiking in the mountains and you know, they're camping and there's like that, I felt a little bit um, like, I hope this still works, right? Because I was sort of leaving the world <laughs> that I knew and, and sort of, you know, we would end up in a forest and it ended up being kind of breathtaking the way it was staged and designed, but, but that was a little bit scary. I think you told me once all good comedies start in the kitchen and end in the forest. Is that it? Is that... No, somebody, somebody famous said that comedy begins in the kitchen and ends up under the stars. Oh. And I love that saying so much. because, And then I realized, of course, that's exactly what Women in Jeopardy does. Which I think is why I just attributed it to you. Now, they, now you're, now you're going to be like the modern, like Ben Franklin. We're just going to, any great quote we have, we're going to be like, oh, Wendy said that. <laughs> that's right. A penny right. Take so, is a penny earth. Yes. That's yeah. me. Now, Richard Giuliani asked, uh, what do you think about the explosion of female funny crime podcasts, such as Drunk Women Solving Crime and My Favorite Murder? Oh my God, I've got to watch them. I don't know about them, but I, I, I'm like all news all the time. And so one of the reasons why Trump has to lose is so that I can move on. I listen to the Daily, the Washington Post reports, Lawrence O'Donnell. And so then I will start watching funny crime podcasts. I didn't know they existed either. <laughs> There's so many good podcasts now, there really are. So, so, you know, we're doing this uh, a Zoom reading, right, of it. So how do you, th so like everything we've talked about has nothing to do with Zoom, right? It has to do with like falling over chairs and running into things and collaboration in the room. How do you think, and you know, one of, one of my big questions as we go into next week is like exactly how do you do a comedy on Zoom where you know, it's all about timing, right? And so all of our timing is like just a little bit off, right? Because we're all hearing it at slightly different moments. So how do you think comedy will translate to, to this, uh, to the internet? Well, I think if any comedy is gonna work, it's slow food because it is quite contained and still and sort of relies on one intrusion coming in. And so it, it's less dependent on the physical comedy. And I feel very secure knowing that those same three wonderful actors are doing it um, for us. And so since they've had their rehearsal period in the flesh, I think that will help. I just hope and pray that the audience doesn't have like a terrible sound lag because I was in the country this summer and we had a satellite and everything. Like I would make a joke on Zoom and then 10 seconds later, somebody would laugh. And those, you know, those 10 seconds were sort of like, oh my God, did I offend them? Why are they <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think, you know, actually in staging it, I was worried that there was not enough movement built mm -hmm. into yeah. the play. And it turned out to not be the case because I think the actors we had were so engaging and we came up with things, but um, it, you know, they're at, they're, they're at a dinner table, right? Which means a, a, 
you only get up from the dinner table for like very, very specific things. And it's a, it's a huge thing to get up and walk away from dinner. You know, like that's a really bold move. You don't do that seven times uh, a dinner, at least, uh, you know, my marriage wouldn't last if I did. So I try to, you know, just once a meal. I know that I think that's part of like the constraints of, of the situation, right? Is that they're trapped at this dinner table and they can't go get the food they want and the beer they want. And, and so, you know, I, I, in a way, I don't like static plays, but this was kind of part of the, the setup for this one was they can't leave the table. That's right. So I think works perfectly right in terms of like for, for a zoom reading, they can't, you can't leave this box you're in right until you get permission for them to be able to do it. Yeah. We, we had a lovely comment from a Leslie J. Miller from Facebook that said, I'm over the moon to listen to the person responsible for the house of yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, but like, I'm, pro I'm not nearly as glamorous as Parker Posey. So I hope it doesn't disappoint. <laughs> oh, no, she didn't write it. Don't give her credit. She did. <laughs> right. She's a part of it. She's part of yeah. it. She, she made it sing, though. She was great. Yeah. So what are you working on next? And you could tell them about the play that I'm, I'm mad that you're doing with someone else. <laughs> oh God, wait, which one? Wait, That's... seriously, Sean, which one? The, in Seattle? Oh, yes. Oh, you, it, it is a good play for you. I know that's what, yeah. Well, that was supposed to be happening this month in Seattle. And oh, so now, really? We, I know I would have come up and seen it. Yeah. Now we don't know for sure when in Seattle, but hopefully next year sometime. Um, I wrote a play called The Laugh Track, which is about the female head writer for the I Love Lucy show. So it's a kind of um, an Adam's Rib romantic comedy behind the scenes at, at I Love Lucy um, about, and it's, it's basically her and her writing partner, who's a man, and then Desi and Lucy, who are Desi and Lucy. And it's, it's very funny. It's about the sort of early days of television. It's about the early days of women's liberation. You know, women are still being asked to do the typing and getting sent for coffee. Um, but again, it was inspired by a, a real woman. And in fact, what happened was I read an obituary in the New York Times and um, this woman had been largely responsible for the I Love Lucy show. And I'd never known that, even though that was one of my favorite shows of all time. So I know it, like another amazing story, right? That you're, you're sharing with everybody for, because people don't know, right? And it's all based on a true story. Yeah. And the only reason she got her start was because of World War II. And so she got her first job in radio because all the men were away fighting. Otherwise, there would have been no way that she got hired. And that's how she got her foot in the door, which is interesting. Gotcha. Um, where, so what's, they don't know when it's coming back. It's supposed to be happening right now. And of course, everything got postponed. So it got postponed also, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I assume next season, if all goes well. Yeah. Oh, no, I think that's so great. So um, for, for audiences that are, have listened to this, they say like, great. I'm excited, they seem great. Why, why should they tune in and watch Slow Food? Really, what is, you know, it's clearly had a million productions as we saw from the, the opening bit. Like why, why tune in and watch it? Why has it resonated so deeply with people? I think they should watch it because of the comic mastery of these particular performers, this particular production, um, this particular script is very funny and tight. I promise you will laugh. I promise you will not be bored. I so I sometimes theater becomes this like this idea that it's good for you, like spinach, you know. This you will actually have fun. And I think if you're involved in a relationship with somebody else, whether you're married or not, you will recognize yourself in the dynamic of this evening. Because I love plays about people behaving badly, but fundamentally these two people do love each other and they sort of they get there by the end of the play. I love that. I, and I, was, I, I think you're right. I, you so rarely see plays about couples that are not like one's having an affair and one's a drunk and one's going to stab the other. And it's like, oh, of course, that's where it all goes like very quickly, you know, and so you're like, oh, no, there. Um, I remember I remember you talking at one of our rehearsals about you were fascinated by the idea that like you could love somebody, but if you didn't eat at the right times in the day, you would you would truly want to kill them. That at some point, and then you have like two pieces of bread and then you're like, 
oh, I love you again. And like suddenly it all, like literally blood sugar does that to our brains that you can have, you know, the appetizer arrives and then you can be in love again with the person that you're with. And even this night night evening in Palm Springs that inspired the play is we were so fed up with this waiter, but after we ate the meal, like everybody was having a great time again, you know, like right. he there wasn't the Greek food delicious, right? The whole world just changes after you've been fed. <laughs> and I remember sort of learning that when, when I had my own children, that it's not rocket science. Like when they behave badly, they are hungry or tired. Those are the only two possibilities. And if you solve those two things, they'll start being delightful children again. Yeah, no, my daughter, if like she starts to like, she starts to cry or she tries to kick and then we're like, oh yeah, we, we were supposed to eat 20 minutes ago. Like it, it is like, it's odd schedule somewhere that, you know, when we don't feed her properly, it's over. Yeah, exactly. And then you deserve what you get. Feed that's right. That, that's right. We should have been paying more attention to it. Well, as we're nearing the end of our segment, um, Wendy, we always have a guest bring a word with them, a word that is important to you, relevant to you, either right now or something that you hold with you always. What would your word be and why? Oh, my God. You guys should have given me some warning so I could be thinking about words. Um, <laughs> My word, I think my word is delight because um, I, we were talking about Aristotle in class today and he says the purpose of theater is to give pleasure, but I like to translate it as the purpose of theater is to give delight. And there's many ways to give delight, like you, it can be a moving drama, it can be sort of provocative politically, or it can be funny, but I think the job of all theater artists, whatever your specialty, is to give delight to an audience. Well, and I feel like right now that's, you know, what we're all so hungry for, right? In terms of, um, you know, we, we feel like we need that uplift and so much of on TV, right, is like, I mean, we watch 90 Day Fiance all the time, which is like ultimate garbage, but it's like <laughs> escapist, it's escapist garbage. You know, and it's like, so the idea of like, okay, what if it was like a well-crafted escapist comedy, right? That was clever and was witty and was, you know, you were like, oh, these jokes have been set up for something. And I feel like that's, that's why this is really the, the great time for your writing. Like, it, <laughs> it feels like, it feels like we've been in trouble for like a long time. So it's always been the time for your writing. But like right now really feels like, you know, it, part of the joy of theater, like there's nothing wrong. And that's really one of the values of our organization is joy, right? There's nothing wrong about coming to the theater and having a fantastic time and laughing and literally slapping your knee, like you say. Right. And, and then, or going home and still talking about what you find funny or a couple days later, still, you know, laughing about something that occurs to you. Yeah. And it's important to our mental health. You know, I, I think that laughing is so, like medicine. I know that that is like, I don't know, probably cliche to say, but it's, it's genuine. I always feel better after I've been laughing. I mean, I even watched Netflix, The Floor is Lava, because I needed to just uncheck. That's I, right, yeah. It was so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. And, and I needed, you know, just to, um, just to like feel human for a moment without being weighted by everything that's going on in the world. And I appreciate that we get to give that to our audiences through your work, which is really exciting. Oh, may it be so. Let's start on Zoom and then we'll do it in the flesh when the day comes. I know, I know, it'd be so great. Um, well, listen, Wendy, thank you so much for being on the show. For everybody that's watching, so on September 15th at five o'clock Pacific time is when we're going to premiere the reading of Slow Food. And then it will be up for four days afterwards. So people will have all the way till Saturday at midnight to be able to catch it. But we're really excited to spend the entire week laughing and enjoying ourselves and really celebrating you as a writer and these fantastic artists. Um, that are in New York, Pittsburgh, and Los Angeles, right? All three of them are spread all over the country. So right. it's fantastic to be able to connect all of them to be able to do it. Um, Brian, who is the waiter, uh, sent me a text today about whether he needed to get like his hair frosted to get ready for, for <laughs> I the reading. Love that. So, I, so I feel like his journey to re becoming the waiter has already started. And I was like, <laughs> you know, he's so he's, uh, he's, he is, he is brilliant. And you know, it's interesting. Like all three of them are are brilliant, but it is a, a vehicle for the waiter, 
You know what I mean? It is really, and I imagine productions live and die based on the quality of the comedy for the waiter is. And we have, you know, I, I feel like one of the best to, in terms I, of doing I think it. so too, because you you have to be a comic genius, but you also have to have this kind of emotional truth, which, which Brian right. has, you know, that it's coming from a real place of not feeling recognized at this point in his life, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great. Awesome. Thank you so much for Wendy for coming on the show. Thank you so much for, for all of your writing. Thank you for, um, I'm so excited for Arizona audiences to get to know you and then to get to know you in person when we do Women in Jeopardy. That'll be, it was so nice to talk to you both and thanks everybody for coming. And I look forward to seeing the Zoom reading myself. Good. Wendy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we just have a couple of other things that we wanted to cover. Um, so there's some special events that are coming up this week. Dropping on Monday, uh, we will be doing a little bit of a special contest for all of our viewers. So please stay tuned to ArizonaTheater.org to see how you can get involved. Uh, also, next week on the show, we have the creative team from my 80-year-old boyfriend. We have Carissa Bertels, we have Christian Demel, and we have composer and lyricist Ed Bell. We're going to talk about the workshop that we just did. Uh, actually, so what's amazing, and I can, I can talk a little bit about this, we did a five-day workshop of a musical because we did the world premiere production and we felt like, oh, it's great. People loved it. There was a commercial producer on it. It was great. But we felt like we'd never really cracked the opening of it. And so we spent five days just trying to figure out the opening of it. And in five days, they wrote two new songs. They changed two scenes. They rewrote the ending of the show and they cut seven pages from the show. So for them to come on and talk about what that is, and they were very sweet. We were able to record uh, at the beginning of the week, what the top of the show looked like and what it looked like at the end. So audiences can really see like in the process of creating a new musical, how does, you know, how much changes and that, so for that one, cause we should always track this. I was in Arizona, Carissa was in Kansas, uh, Christian was in New York and Ed was in Yorkshire, England. And so like, that's where the four of us were. So we always had to start every morning at nine in the morning because that, <laughs> that was the only way that we could spread across the continent. The time zones. The time zone so that Ed could work for a couple hours before it became like nine o'clock at night and be able to do. So we're excited to have them on and to really share the process of like how musicals are getting made in the Zoom age also. That is super cool. And, and with Zoom, we have that flexibility, right? So I just love that. I also want to point out how the sun is going down in my house and I'm facing away. That's right, yeah. <laughs> see the sun going down. So I'm trying to do it this. So if I'm getting taller, that's the reason why I'm avoiding the sunlight. <laughs> Great, so uh, please stay tuned for our call board that's coming up of upcoming events and we will see you all next week. Thank you all so much. Hi, I'm Will Rogers and welcome to this week's call board. ATC's digital play reading series is headed back to a digital screen near you with Winnie McLeod's Slow Food. Don't miss this opportunity to hear this hilarious play performed by the cast that originated the roles. We will offer an entire host of community events and ways for you to engage with us at home. Slow Food premieres September 15th and it will end streaming September 19th. You can get information on the play reading itself and all of the events around it at arizonatheater.org slash slow food. Now we'd like to throw it to our friend Shelby Matasek at the Arizonis Theater Awards of Excellence. My name is Shelby Matisic, and I am the acting board president of the Arizona Theater Awards of Excellence. Although our stages have been dark for several months, it means a great deal to the entire board to be able to reflect on the many shows that were able to be adjudicated this season. This year's celebration will be going virtual. While we'll miss celebrating in person, this will give us the opportunity to feature even more individuals from our community in the event itself. The Zonies have been working hard to give back to the community this year and support our artists and organizations. We've donated $10,000 directly and raised an additional $5,570 through our Zoni Relief Fund that has all gone directly back into our theater community. Uh, if you would like a full list of the nominees, you can check that out on our uh, the Zoni website. And thank you to all of the amazing artists and community members that make 
theater possible in Arizona. Thank you so much for joining us for Hanging Focus today. Don't forget to come back next week and have a great holiday weekend and see you.